Yes, we've already talked about China, but that was ancient China. So we're going to move forward in time now to the period known as medieval China. Now, before we move forward, I want to go back and you're going to get a lot of review, but this is really, it's, it's not just review to help you, but it's also a indication that these are things still being practiced in China. Um, many things are still being practiced from the ancient world on through the medieval world. Okay, so the thing that we're going to start with is that mandate of heaven. Remember, the Chinese believed, starting with the uh, Zhou dynasty, that families were given the mandate of heaven by the god Qian. And Qian decided if you were worthy of ruling or not, and if you were not, then a new family was allowed to be moved in. And it could be anything from the family being corrupt and selfish, or a natural disaster might be an indication that Qian has removed that mandate of heaven and a new family can move in. So that's very, very old. It goes all the way back to the ancient um, ancient uh, empire of the Zhou dynasty, or ancient dynasty of the Zhou's, and it still lives on in the medieval period. Medieval China is still practicing then and now Buddhism. And remember, Buddhism was actually born in India. Siddhartha Gautama is the man who started this religion. He is sometimes referred to as Buddha, which means the enlightened one. And his whole religion is based on the Four Noble Truths, which basically melt down into the idea that wanting material things and needing material things is the root of all evil. Uh, he also practiced the idea of the Eightfold Path and basically that is a, a way of looking at the world where you speak the right thing, you do the right thing, you think the right thing. It's all about basically boiling down to be good to others. Don't worry so much about yourself but be good to others. And then of course we have to bring back Ahsoka who is the guy who turned to Buddhism. He was a pretty evil guy in, in India and he turned to Buddhism when he realized the, the sins that he was committing and the murderous acts that he was suddenly ashamed of led him towards this very peaceful religion known as Buddhism. So don't forget too that the guy in the upper right hand corner, left hand corner, left, left, left hand corner, that's Buddha. Uh, the wheel here is an indication of Buddhism. It's the eightfold path with the eight spokes. And this guy down here at the bottom is not Buddha. That's Puta. And he represents the happiness and the calmness and the rightness that you feel when you turn to Buddhism. Now don't forget philosophies. We have Taoism and this is all about harmony in nature and Confucianism. So Confucianism has lots of uh, key things that, that Confucius wanted us to respect. The big thing is family, especially elders. And of course, Taoism and Confucianism both use the yin-yang symbol. Now let's talk about trade. We've talked about trade quite a bit in the past, but this is still going on in medieval China, so we're going to talk about it again. Here's the top items coming out of China along the Silk Road. Porcelain, uh, we still use porcelain to make dolls, to make toilets, uh, lots of things are made of porcelain. Anything made out of paper came from China. Paper money, paper umbrellas, wallpaper, toilet paper, thank goodness for the Chinese. Uh, the printing press was born in China. It will be perfected by a European later, but it was born in China. The compass, which allows Europe to, to really go out and expand their worldview and take over other places and do really bad things but it, the compass got them the knowledge and the comfort of knowing where they were so people were willing to go out on ships and explore and then of course textiles specifically silk will come out of China quick review on the Silk Road 4,000 miles from China to Constantinople which will uh, remember Aleppo was once the end of the Silk Road and now it's gone all the way to Constantinople and along this Silk Road this path of trade there are ideas and goods picked up and dropped off all along this Silk Road and so the Silk Road connected this very large world at the time and started making it smaller and smaller and smaller. Think how small our world is today. You can talk to somebody in Russia with the snap of a finger. You're talking to somebody in Russia. So 
for these guys though that's a brand new thought to connect yourself to other dynasties across the continent so don't forget too though that the Silk Road was very very dangerous people waited along the Silk Road to take your goods and take your life um, instead of bartering or or buying so that's a pretty good review of the Silk Road Chinese writing is a new topic we have not yet discussed and we need to not only discuss the the Chinese writing but how it influenced the the Japanese so the Japanese are going to borrow a lot of ideas from the Chinese just like Americans have borrowed tons of ideas from European people it's going to be the same thing so the Chinese will start writing before the Japanese and in the beginning they kind of went willy-nilly with the characters as they were creating them you know how English is so very refined but these guys kind of just went in all different directions to start with so there's actually 50,000 characters in the written Chinese language today only about 7,000 of them are used they're still they're still refining it and a person who lives in China still probably within their entire lifetime will not use or comprehend all 50,000 original characters. It's just a very complicated language. So the Japanese took the written language of the Chinese and they simplified it greatly, um, but the basis of it is in Chinese in Japan. Now architecture also is going to influence Japan. So the basic idea and structure of the Chinese stress balance and symmetry to the max. So if you build a home, you have to build it so that it is equal. You can't have this this beautiful round room on one side of the building and it not have a mate on the other side. It has to be symmetrical. The Chinese feel like that gives them balance in their lives if their surroundings are balanced and so they're very into symmetry. They also have curved roofs, which we'll come back to in a minute, but this is what they look like. So we can't forget the Great Wall. Uh, the Great Wall, of course, was started by the Qin Dynasty, and it was it was small walls in different areas of weakness so that foreigners could not attack them without them being noticed. And so eventually, many, many, many years after the Qin Dynasty has come and gone, they somebody will start connecting these walls. So you could say the Qin Dynasty and Shi Huangdi is the one who started the Great Wall, but nobody, no one person is responsible or one dynasty is responsible for building it because it was a series of connecting walls that already existed. And so today it's 1,500 miles long. Uh, and don't forget that, again, these guys stress nature with, with Taoism. And so they did not blow up mountains and make tunnels and things like that to build this wall like, like we would do here in America. They went with nature. And so the wall is very zigzaggy and up and down because they went with the geography of the land and didn't interfere with it. So I told you that the Japanese are highly influenced by the Chinese for architecture. They, they're not as uh, hardcore about the symmetry, but you can see a lot of Chinese in the Japanese architecture. And one of the big things is the roofs. So the rooftops are slanted. In China, and to be honest with you, I'm not sure if Japan believes this or not, but in China, they believe that evil spirits will sit on your on your rooftop, like hover over you and watch over your family and, you know, play tricks on you. And if they have you have a slanted roof, they won't be able to find their footing on your roof. So it's to ward off evil spirits. So they can't sit on your rooftop. And again, I do not know enough about Japanese culture to know if they believe that part of it, but the, the architecture is very, very similar. Now, medieval Japan and ancient Japan and modern Japan is something called an archipelago. And an archipelago is just simply a group or chain of islands. Now that archipelago of Japan is about 4,000 islands. Most people will only live on the biggest of the four. So Hokkaido, Honshu, Shikoku, and Kyushu are the main four islands. Now that's not to say that uh, they're spread out. This whole thing is about the size of California, this whole archipelago. So if you smushed all of it together, it's about the size of California. California has 
four, not quite 40 million people living there. And when I picture California, I think overcrowded, but this place is the same size as that and has 125 million instead of just 40 million. So super overcrowded. Geographically, Japan is not sitting on the most opportune place. There are volcanoes throughout the 4,000 islands, which do blow up, and they have earthquakes actually pretty pretty commonly. Uh, the danger of earthquakes in Japan is many of their buildings are still made of wood. And so when an earthquake goes off, um, especially if it's in the middle of the day when people are home cooking, it's very, very easy for an entire neighborhood to catch on fire and burn to the ground because a lot of their stuff is made of wood and bamboo still. Um, but that, that building kind of helps the buildings stay intact because it sways with the rumble if that makes sense but then it's very susceptible to fire so you know there's good and bad to both now Japan does experience all four seasons which I think most of us don't realize that the most severe of their seasons is typhoon season which comes late in the summer and if you want a good indication of how bad a typhoon can be there was a typhoon that took place in Japan in 2011 and if you go to this website you'll see how unbelievably traumatic a typhoon season can become so if if the link is dead and you can't see it it's not the be all end all because there's nothing that you're going to need to know for the test for it but it's interesting to look at and see the destruction that these people are left with very often and they have to rebuild and they do so the location of japan you can see it here on the map it is the neighbor to korea so anything that went from china made a stop in Korea and then went to Japan so these three places are very similar to one another and then Korea and Japan are separated by the Sea of Japan so all three of these places are going to have a likeness because they're neighbors and they share ideas now they do have their own special religion that is not shared with anybody else not China not Korea so in Japan the official religion of the Japanese is Shinto there's no founder, there's no holy book, we're not really sure how old it is, but we do know that it stresses the importance of respect for things you already know that the Japanese and the Chinese respect because they're Buddhist. So nature, of course, forces of nature, these guys also uh, worship ancestors. So like a lot of other religions, they believe that their ancestors are all around them and they can protect them or play tricks on them. And these spirits are called kami. And the kami travel between space and time through something called a Tori gate, which you see over here on the right hand side of the screen. So a Tori gate, again, is passive for those spirits they go through the gate and that puts them in different places according to Shinto it is easier for a kami to travel through a Tori gate that's on water and so lots of them are located on water that's not to say they can't be on land because they definitely are but it's just easier in their belief for those spirits to travel on water a very unique thing about Shinto is that they believe that all humans are good that your environment you can surround yourself with evil things and so you might do bad things because of that influence but if you remove those bad things you're, you'll go back to being good again that humans are always good at the core which I think is just a wonderful way to look at life and here's one of the Tory gates on land so I think it would creep me out a little bit to walk through this so I often wonder do Japanese ever go through the Tory gate on a boat um, do they feel weird walking through it it just seems like if spirits are traveling through that with you it might be a little awkward so again Shinto is nature and ancestors being very very important and highly worshipped and if you practice Shinto which all Japanese do then you can also practice Buddhism and Confucianism and legalism and any of the other isms in the Asian world because none of them have a God so they're not interfering with one another you're not worshiping a different God uh, but Shinto is the legal official state religion of Japan and no place else it does not exist any place else so as a review evidence of the influence of China over Japan is Buddhism, their writing, and architecture. And don't forget, Shinto though exists only in Japan and no place else in the world. Let's look at leadership in Japan. 
the emperor, and this is different than China or Korea, the emperor up until World War II was worshipped as a divine being. They believed that the emperor was a god on earth. And uh, Hirohito was the emperor during World War II, and he was forced by the United States to admit to his people that he was not a god. So up until then, the people of Japan truly believed that their emperor was a divine being, a god living among them. All the stuff that we've talked about Japan so far you might know, but there's a couple other things you probably don't. Medieval Japan used to practice something called feudalism, and it is a class system based on land ownership and the rights to that land and loyalty to the person above you in society. So let's take a closer look at how they set that up. At the very top of the Japanese feudal system is, of course, the emperor, who they see as a god. Right under the emperor is a very small class of warlords that are like the right hand of the emperor. So they are military, and if the emperor ever needs anything, they will be their Johnny on the spot to help the emperor out. And in exchange for that loyalty, that military loyalty, the shogun is given a lot of land. So the shogun can't do all the, the fighting and all the producing of food and, and everything that society needs. So the shogun each divide their land between a group known as the daimyos. So the daimyos in turn, these are like noble rich people. So they're not going to actually do all the work. They're not actually going to go fight because the daimyos are noble. So they hire samurais and samurais are given land in exchange for their loyalty, their military loyalty to the daimyo. And then the samurai will divide their land among the people who actually do the everyday work, the agricultural work. And that's going to be peasants, merchants, artisans, which make up 90% of the population. So these people are not given land. They are allowed to live on the land of the samurai. And in exchange for living on that land, they have to be loyal to the samurai in uh, terms of giving them food, producing food. So it's a layered system, a feudal system, very, very similar to what we're going to talk about in Europe in the next couple units. Um, but theirs is based um, much more on w a warlike effort than it is for a foundation of a society, at least in this time period. So let's look at this, uh, these groups of people one more time. So an emperor, don't forget he's a god. A shogun is people who control the military of Japan. And then you have the daimyo, which is the landlords, the rich people. And then you have the samurai, the highly skilled war warriors, often known as Bushido. And the leader of the, like the number one samurai is going to be named the shogun, like the number one shogun. So these guys are the heroes of society, the samurai. And they're very, very, very important in the medieval period. Later, that's going to go away. And they're kind of going to be seen as... Um, I don't want to say a traitor, but but as a bad group, like we're, we're ashamed of the history, of the violence of our history, and so being a samurai was kind of a joke and not so good anymore. And many of the samurais will, will commit suicide, go into battle and do crazy things to get themselves killed, or actually commit suicide themselves to die with honor rather than be laughed at in society. So in this time period, medieval period, they're heroes, and then that's going to go away later. And don't forget at the very bottom of that hierarchy, you have the peasants who rent land, pay really high fees. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, but they get protection in, in exchange and a place to live. I know this unit must feel like we're bouncing all over the place from China to Japan to Korea, back to China and Japan and Korea. But it just, this unit is very, very all over the place. <laughs> Schizophrenic unit. So we're we're going to talk about trade routes very quickly there's only four slides for it and you've heard a lot of it before but just as a review because it's going to be on the test in some form or another out of india we get sugar spices and textiles china we've already talked about all these things you see here in front of you and then persia is also famous for porcelain we've already talked about this as well items traded in africa in uh, at least North Africa are often traded along the Trans-Saharan trade routes and those major things being traded are galt, galt, gold and salt and of course the belief in Islam.
Now we've not talked about maritime trade routes and maritime simply means anything related to the sea. So we had trade routes happening across the Indian Ocean and the South China Sea. You see the map here in front of you. It was pretty extensive. So on the water, spices were coming out of India and paper products out of China. That's the big two. And lastly, there's a very wonky trade path that was never named. It goes from the Black Sea to the Baltic Sea and big big thing that was traded along this path is amber and amber is fossilized uh, tree sap it's very very prominent in the Baltic Sea a lot of it is underwater because the trees along the shore uh, will fall into the water and it's very 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 cold and so this stuff stays preserved it's a lot of money if you can find one like this with bugs inside of it it's coming from trees so it can, it's very doable to find it but when you find one intact like this one it's a lot of money and people wear it uh, thinking that it's going to bring you good luck Okay, so now that I've totally creeped you out making you look at this big giant spider, we are already done with this unit. That was quick, wasn't it? So most of the units from this point out are going to be really super quick. So I'm glad you're sure you're glad. I'm sure you're glad to hear that, right? All right, so I will see you in the next unit. Hope you enjoyed China and Japan in the medieval period.